Dear colleagues, dear friends, dear ICUI member, I am very honored and proud to introduce the speaker for tonight. As you know, the ICOI is having a bimensual um, lecture and I am extremely proud to introduce my friend Dr. Avi Shitrit, which is a board certified periodontist. He is an executive board member of the ICOI since many years, responsible for the ADIA, a fantastic clinician and a great personality. So he will talk tonight about extraction socket grafting for implant site development, which is what we should do every day. Uh, the lecture will be about 50, 55 minutes, and then we will have time for questions. Thank you very much, Professor Palti, for the lovely introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. I thank you for joining me on a Saturday. I know it's uh, usually not, not a day you like to work, but I uh, thank you for joining me. And uh, we're going to talk today about extraction socket grafting for, for implant site development. And I know... Uh, or I'm sure rather that most of you are doing this daily, uh, if not, you know, multiple times a day. And for me, it's probably the most common implant rate related surgical procedure that I do. And I think it's worth revisiting. I think it's worth revisiting. Um, you know, every time I attend a lecture, I pick up a pearl or two. So I'm going to show you specifically what I do in, in my office. Um, that I have found to be extremely predictable. I'm going to show you the materials I use. We'll talk a little bit about material selection. I'm going to show you specifically what I use. I'll show you um, one or two cases of, of, of one of my procedures, um, and then we'll, we'll open for, for answers and questions. So a little bit about me. I actually uh, grew up in, in beautiful Montreal. Ooh, there we go. In, in Montreal, Canada. A great city to grow up in. I actually did a bachelor's degree in in uh, biology. Sorry, a bachelor's degree in anatomy at uh, McGill University, which is in downtown Montreal, which is really really quite lovely. Once I finished that, I moved on to University of Montreal, where I did my dental degree. I actually practiced in private practice as a general dentist for two years, and then moved to the University of British Columbia. There, I did my periodontal residency. Um, so I you know, I've visited the West Coast and East Coast of Canada, uh, spent uh, almost my entire life then there and uh, decided uh, when I actually moved back to Montreal, I couldn't take the winters anymore. So I moved to Florida in 2000 and I've been here for a little over 20 years. Uh, my practice, I actually work out of two practices. I have a, a colleague, some oral surgeons I work with in Fort Lauderdale. Um, and then my practice is in Deerfield Beach, which is about... Uh, 20 kilometers north of Fort Lauderdale. And this, this restaurant, two, two coves, it's actually called the Two Georges on the Cove, is in the plaza where my practice is. So if you ever come visit, we'll, we'll certainly go there and have a drink by the, by the water. So let's uh, just review what we're gonna discuss today. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about bone graft materials, specifically bone, uh, particulate bone graft materials. We're gonna talk about membranes and then I'm going to talk to you about the, the procedure and how I do the procedure and what, uh, what the outcomes are. So we all know that osseointegration is one of the most successful treatment modalities in dentistry. We have dental implant survival rates that exceed 95% over the 10 year mark. Um, and you know I think that's, that's huge because when I did my residency and I'm gonna date myself a little bit, I was actually taught to do hemisections. I was taught to do root amputations because we did not have um, the, the reliability of dental implants that we have today. We didn't have the success rates. So the thought process was to maintain teeth for as long as possible. Obviously now with, with successful dental implant dentistry, we know that you know, trying to hemisect a tooth, trying to crown lengthen a tooth in some circumstances really doesn't make sense when we can successfully place an implant. And part of that, at least in my practice, always starts with an extraction and bone grafting. Um, but we'll get to that shortly. So part of the success, obviously, with, with the dental implants is the wonderful biocompatibility that we have with, with titanium. We know that the term osseointegration 
is describes a direct connection between living bone and the surface of a load bearing implant. And that of course is at the light microscopic level. So that's huge. That's, that's really changed dentistry. And you know, the reason we're all here today is to talk about dental implants and how to prepare an ideal site to receive a dental implants. Before we do that though, let's talk about the extraction socket. Typical patient and you know, today's Saturday, Monday morning, I will get one, sometimes two phone calls, a patient broke a tooth over the weekend, uh, bit into something, typically they're, they're endodontic treated, treated teeth that uh, have, have failed or have fractured. And patient comes into the office, we devise some sort of provisional, uh, you know, sometimes it's as simple as, as taking a, a quick impression, making a, a vacuum form suck down, putting the, the tooth or just some composite material in there until we can get something more, more sturdy as a provisional. But we end up taking the tooth out. Now, what happens when we take a tooth out and let it heal naturally? We know that we're going to lose soft and hard tissue volume. And we know that we're going to lose about 50% of that bone volume in six months. And we know that that volume is going to be lost in an apical direction and in the lingual direction. Um, so we're going to lose bone volume. And what's interesting, when I was in dental school in the uh, late 80s, we were taught to actually, when we did an extraction, to take our fingers and compress that socket so it would heal more quickly. Obviously, there was no thought of placing a dental implant there. And what we want to try to do today is obviously regenerate that entire process. And, you know, I'd like to give you articles, just reference articles. This, these two articles talk about the changes in bone following uh, tooth extraction. And basically, they all say the same thing. We're going to lose bone volume within six months in an apical and in a palatal or a lingual direction. So what happens is we have at the time of extraction an intact alveolar process. Six months down the road, we're faced with a resorbed alveolar, alveolar process. So what we're experiencing here is, is bone, as far as bone healing, is repair, not regeneration. And the difference between the two is when we talk about repair, it's healing with tissue that differs in morphology or function from the original tissue. Whereas when we talk about regeneration, it's complete restoration of the original morphology. So in, in dental implant uh, procedures, we want to regenerate that alveolar process. That alveolar process is tooth dependent. Once we remove that tooth, the body doesn't see a need for it, but we do want to regenerate that. So before we get into the actual procedure, let's talk about the extraction socket healing, the normal extraction socket healing and what happens. Four phases, there's the, obviously the blood clot, the wound cleansing, followed by tissue formation and followed by that tissue modeling and remodeling. So let's look at those independently or one at a time rather, and let's uh, examine them. So we start off with, as we all like to say, the atraumatic removal of a tooth. And we know that actually that's a misnomer in the sense that we're severing, uh, we're causing trauma. It's surgical trauma, it's intentional trauma, um, but it's trauma. Now we wanna be as delicate with the tissues as possible to cause as minimal inflammation and destruction as possible, but nevertheless, we're talking about surgical trauma. So the first phase following that trauma is the formation of a blood clot. Blood clot, as you know, consists of red and white blood cells. It consists of uh, platelets, but also a fibrin matrix. And the blood clot has two functions. First function is to protect the denuded tissues. So we've actually removed the tooth there's now a hole in our alveolar tissues. So the body wants to protect that from obviously toxins, bacterial invasion. So it forms a seal or a blood clot. But what's also crucial is this fibrin matrix. And the reason it's crucial, it's gonna allow cells from the periphery. So our cells that are going to cleanse that wound, our cells that are going to regenerate that tissue to migrate. So it acts as a scaffolding or, or an extracellular matrix, if you will. Once that occurs, the wound cleansing occurs. So we have inflammatory cells, neutrophils, monocyte that populate our clot. And through phagocytosis, these cells are going to clean or remove necrotic tissue. They're going to eat up bacteria. So they're essentially going to clean that area out. A little later in the process, the macrophage is going to show up. The macrophage is going to continue the wound cleansing. It's going to... Um, through phagocytosis, continue to brighten that wound, but it's also gonna secrete growth factors. 
Those growth factors are going to involve or promote the proliferation of fibroblasts and endothelial cells. So when we have fibroblasts, obviously they're going to produce collagen. We have endothelial cells that are going to produce blood vessels or form blood vessels rather. Um, we're going to have a very cellular rich, very vascular tissue that we call granulation tissue. So this granulation tissue is, is, if you will, the fork in the road. What happens to this granulation tissue is going to de determine whether we have regeneration or repair. Um, that, will, that tissue will mature, and whether we get regeneration or repair depends on two factors, the availability of cell, ty cell types, meaning if I want bone, obviously I want osteoblasts. I also need the, the cells to regenerate or uh, recruit the cells that are needed. So I need growth factors. I need uh, bone morphogenic growth factor. I need platelet derived growth factor. I need growth factors to recruit these bone forming cells and help stimulate them. So what we want ultimately in order to have regeneration occurs, we want this socket filled with a, a very vascular connective tissue to mature into bone. So can we promote regeneration? We certainly can. We can physically exclude cer certain cell types. So we can exclude the faster moving gingival soft tissue cells um, by the use of a barrier membrane. The principle of guided bone regeneration, which is the principle we use every day in, in, uh, in our socket graft healing, is the use of a barrier membrane that's gonna do a few things. It's gonna pr preserve a space. So it's gonna create a biological space it's going to allow the ingrowth of bone producing cells of osteogenic cells, and it's gonna exclude the migration of our gingival soft tissue cells. So that is going to help us regenerate that alveolar process. So we have over here a schematic obviously of our extraction socket. Um, we have bone graft particulate in there that we'll talk about. We have a membrane overlying it and we have our soft tissue on top of that. So that membrane is going to prevent the faster moving soft tissue cells from this soft tissue surrounding that extraction socket from populating that defect. And it's gonna allow the slower moving uh, bone forming cells, either the osteoblasts or the non-differentiated mesenchymal stem cells that are coming from the periphery of that socket to populate that defect and will allow us to regenerate that alveolar process. And we can, we know predictably now, remove a tooth and using the principles of guided bone regeneration, we can regenerate that alveolar process. Now, we may not regenerate it to its initial size and volume, but certainly we'll regenerate it enough that we can predictably place a dental implant. And the technique I'm going to share with you, um, extremely predictable, extremely cost-effective, but also you will find that you will not get a concavity at the alveolar crest of, of, uh, of, of the socket, um, unlike you will in some other techniques. So why graft bone? Um, obviously, uh, we want to graft bone to place implants. You can see in a case like this uh, with a CBCT section where teeth were extracted, no socket preservation was performed, and clearly there's not enough bone volume to, to place dental implants. And lateral ridge augmentation, which is still a predictable procedure, is far more involved, in my opinion, than grafting at the time of, of extracting a tooth. So I will say 90% of my the teeth that are extracted in my office get grafted. Even if the patient is unsure whether they want an implant, they're not sure, they may want a bridge, I always recommend grafting, preserving the alveolar process, and at least giving us the option. Um, I just want to share with you a lot of the times when I lecture about extraction and socket grafting, I'm asked about the costs, and I'll just give you a, you know, an average cost of what, what we charge in our office. So obviously extraction and socket grafting, we're going to remove our non-restorable or endodontically failed tooth and preserve the alveolar process. Um, start to finish about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, depending on the extraction, depending on whether you were using PRF and, uh, I, I do use PRF or platelet-rich fibrin. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a good adjunct, but essentially I'm charging about 300 for an extraction, bone graft's another 400, uh, 350 for a membrane, PRF is about 300. So about $1,350 in my office to get a tooth out and they socket grafted. 
which saves time and effort if the patient wants to place an implant down the road. So definitely a less expensive procedure than if they extract the tooth and then later decide we have to regenerate that alveolar process with you know, a one wall defect. And typically three to four months, I'll place the dental implant. So let's, let's look at a case that we'll, we'll look at partially because I'm gonna go through some of my, my uh, you know, thought process. So here we have a tooth that's endodontically treated, a mandibular first um, premolar. We, uh, sorry, second premolar. We have um, obviously some supracrestal tooth structure. And back in the day, this would have been a crown lengthening procedure, but crown lengthening to bring three millimeters of, of sound tooth structure supracrestally, we're gonna compromise the support of that tooth. It's a single rooted tooth. We may compromise the frication of the molar behind it. So obviously in today's world, removing that tooth and subsequently placing an implant makes a lot more sense. So the tooth is removed. Um, certainly we, I could have removed the tooth without reflecting a flap, but because of the technique that I'm gonna show you, I reflect the full thickness flap, buckle and lingual, remove the tooth, um, and then we're gonna graft that socket. So at this point, let's look at what we're gonna graft that socket with. Let's talk a little bit about bone um, and the bone graft materials that are available for socket grafting and what to choose and when. What's the function of a bone graft? Well, it's gonna help preserve a biological space, certainly in, in, in a less than ideal defect. If it's not a four wall defect, it's going to help preserve a biological space. It's gonna help with clot formation. It's gonna act as a scaffolding to allow for cell migration. So it's going to be an osteoconductive material. If it's a mineralized graft, it's gonna form, a, it's gonna have a calcium source for mineralizing the bone and it may or may not have BMPs, bone morphogenic protein, if it's a human product. So let's, let's look at those things um, individually. But before we do, let's review very quickly what happens to a bone graft when we place it either in a socket or in a lateral ridge augmentation or, or in a sinus for that matter. So we have here a lateral ridge augmentation procedure. There's my particular bone graft material. There's the collagen membrane I'm gonna place over it. What, what happens here over a time period? And this is a tenting screw, which I use a tenting technique that uh, perhaps will be a, uh, a, an upcoming seminar as well. But what happens to that bone graft material? Regardless of the material we use, what happens to it? Let's look at that. Well, the first thing that happens is, is osteoblasts are gonna start forming bone around that graft material. Now that, gra that osteoid is the precursor to bone. Bone is mostly type one collagen that is then mineralized by the osteoblast. So essentially osteoid is non-mineralized bone. So we get the formation of a pre-bone, if you will, around that graft particle. Um, at the same time, that graft particle, which is seen as foreign material, is being resorbed by the osteoclasts. So the osteoclasts are resorbing the graft material. The, the osteoblasts are forming bone around that graft material. Over time, you're going to actually see bone forming within that particulate material. And then within the allotted period of time, you'll have graft turnover. Now, depending on that material, depending on the size of the defect, it could be three months, four months, five months, six months, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But our goal essentially is to replace that graft material with host bone. We don't want to place our implants in non-vascularized graft material, we wanna place our implants in vascularized host bone. And when we open that case, when we go back four months later, that's what we wanna see. We wanna see host bone. This is the patient's bone. I know there may be a few particles here and here floating around, um, but we wanna place our, our implants in vascular host bone. That's the goal. Um, so we wanna go from particulate to host bone. And you know, our, our graft material is going to, in some ways, uh, determine how quickly that occurs and how predictably as well. So let's look at particular bone graft materials and let's look at uh, what choices we have. Okay, a couple of terms. Osseoinductive, uh, which I'm sure you've all heard before, is the ability for a material to stimulate new bone growth. So de novo bone formation. And really the only thing that will do that um, is, is BMP, bone morphogenic protein. When we talk about something that's osseoconductive, we're talking about a material that provides a scaffolding. So 
any of the graft materials you use, anything you put in that socket will act as a scaffolding. So all particular bone grafts are osseoconductive. So we don't have to repeat that again. So categories of, of bone grafts, there's obviously a autogenous bone from the patient themselves. There's an allograft, same species, so human. Xenograft, which is a different species, and an alloplast, which is synthetic or made in, in the lab. Now, for many, many years, and certainly when I started in my in dental implant career, autogenous bone was considered the gold standard for bone grafting procedures. Um, and there's no doubt that taking bone from the host um, it's, it's living tissue, it's going to have living cells, it's going to have uh, osteoinductive properties, it's going to have BMPs. Um, there's a lot going for host bone. However, um, at least from my perspective, I only harvest intraorally. I don't do an extraoral bone grafting. So that limits the amount of bone I can harvest. As far as intraoral, intraoral donor sites, certainly there's the mandibular symphysis, there's the external oblique ridge, there's the ramus, there's the, the tuberosity that can give us some nice cancellous bone. So we do have some intraoral sites. However, that's the, the, the big however. I think a, you need a second surgical site for harvesting so that, that increases morbidity. So two surgical sites, you know, even if one is adjacent to the extraction site, you're still extending your flap, you're still getting bone from another site. So there's additional chair time. And ultimately, there's a limited amount of bone you can harvest from an intraoral donor site. So for that reason, um, I do not use autogenous bone in my socket grafting procedures. What I do use almost exclusively is an allograft. So this is from a human donor. Um, so it's from cadavers. And, you know, today there's multiple, multiple different types of allografts available as far as, as configuration and density. You can get a cortical bone graft, you can get a cancellous bone graft, you can get a cortical cancellous bone graft, you can get a mineralized bone graft, and you can get a demineralized bone graft. And I think that leads to a lot of confusion. It leads to a lot of statements, I think, from the podium that uh, may or may not be true. So let me review these um, briefly with you just so we can we can talk about what makes sense and what doesn't. So if we look at the difference between cortical bone and cancellous bone, obviously cortical bone is far denser than, than cancellous bone comparing the two. So as a result, cortical bones, uh, because of, of a, was more dense, it's going to turn over more slowly. So it's going to give you more volume stability, more dimensional stability than cancellous bone. But I think the biggest confusing or, or muddled water, if you will, is whether we should use mineralized or demineralized bone. And let me walk you through this, um, at least the theory behind it and some of the science as well. So allografts, being a human product, contains the BMP, bone morphogenic protein. Excuse me for just a minute. And as we mentioned earlier, BMP is osseoinductive. It will produce bone. It will recruit osteoblasts. It will recruit non-differentiated mesenchymal stem cells to turn into osteoblasts and they will form bone. When we talk about an allograft, the BMPs are mineral bound. So they're bound to the mineral component of bone. When you demineralize a bone graft, you expose the BMP. So it would make sense that if you're using a demineralized bone graft, you have exposed BMP, it's going to be more osseoinductive. It's going to produce bone more quickly there's a but, there always seems to be a but. So the but is the amount of BMP in commercially available bone grafts varies. It varies between uh, different bone banks, but also within the same batch, within the same uh, bone bank. As well, as the donor is older, the amount of BMP content diminishes. So donors over 50, unfortunately, have diminished bone BMP content. So although theoretically it makes sense to use demineralized bone because it's going to produce bone more quickly, the amount of BMP you're getting is not guaranteed. As well, because mineralized bone is denser, it's, it's mineralized, it's more dimensionally stable. It's also going to give you a calcium source for mineralizing of the bone. So the bone, as I mentioned earlier, is formed as pre-bone osteoid, which is demineralized bone essentially. It's type 1 collagen in about 90%. And then the body or the osteoblasts are going to mineralize it. 
Um, if you don't have a ready calcium source, it's gonna just take a little bit longer. But I wanna share with you a study that I think, regardless of whether you use mineralized or demineralized bone is gonna make you feel better. So they, it's a histological comparison of healing after tooth extraction using mineralized versus demineralized uh, freeze bone allograft. A study in the Journal of Periodontology from 2012, um, and they had 40 patients, they divided them in two groups. They used FDBA, so freeze-dried bone allograft in 20 of them, demineralized freeze bone allograft, they took cores in 19 weeks. What they, and I'll go down. So de demineralized bone had greater vital bone, so 38% versus 24, and demineralized bone had less residual graft particles, 8% versus 25, which makes sense. We talked how mineralized bone is more dimensionally stable. In order to be more dimensionally stable, it resorbs more slowly. Therefore, you're gonna have more graft, residual graft at, at a given time. So the conclusion was greater new bone formation with demineralized bone. Of course, you have to take into account that's 19 weeks. But to me, that's not the, although that was their conclusion, I want to share with you what I think uh, is more vital to understand from this article. And it's this line right here. No significant difference in alveolar ridge dimensions between the two groups. So it's not going to give you more ridge preservation. It's not going to give you less ridge preservation whether you're using mineralized or demineralized bone. At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. Um, you'll be able to graft with either mineralized or demineralized, get fairly the same results as far as ridge preservation and put your bone in, uh, your implant in rather in host bone. Whether it's 38% vital bone or 24% at 19 weeks, I don't think that's gonna make a difference. And over time, the mineralized bone will obviously resorb and you'll get new bone as well. So I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I think whatever you're comfortable with, whatever makes sense, but I think the, the take home message here is no significant difference in alveolar ridge dimensions between the two groups. So for me, um, I sit on the fence, if you will. So Allograft, it's, it's a human product. You can use a mineralized, demineralized. They are now available. Um, mineralized and demineralized within the same little vial. So you can have your cake and eat it too, if you will. I like to use a cortical cancellous mix, which again, gives me some some cortical bones, some cancellous mix, which will allow me to have more dimensional stability. I like to use a 250 to 1000 microns, turnover is about three or four months. And that's my go-to for, for socket grafts. That's really what I'll put in my socket grafts, um, unless there's something unexpected. The next category I wanna to talk to you about are the xenografts. So xenografts are from a different species, usually uh, bovine, sometimes porcine, sometimes equine. They're osteoconductive, as we, uh, as we said, they act as a scaffolding. The big problem with these bone graft materials in general is that the turnover can be very long. And when I say long, I mean very long years. Um, if you look at, bovine bone and anorganic bovine bone, essentially hydroxyapatite, which is what bone is composed of. Um, you know, for a while there was the concern with mad cow disease, bovine spongiform encephalitis, but these are safe because there's, there are no proteins in there that, that can transmit it. But the major drawback is its slow resorption. If you look at a study uh, from 2004, they found bovine particles present after four and a half years. There is an article in the Journal of Periodontology from 2007 that they found after 14 years, they still had 21% uh, bone volume. Uh, so that was a particular graph that had not resorbed. Very long turnover. It's not always a bad thing. Let me show you why. If you have exposed threads, you've placed your implant, you have exposed threads. What I like to do is uh, put a bovine xenograft on top of that cover it with a membrane. Um, the bovine xenograft will be dimensionally stable, will create, if you will, uh, maintain that biological space for bone to grow into it and integrate with that implant. The other place I use it is in sinus grafts because I want dimensional stability as well. Gravity will, will cause that sinus graft to, to migrate apically, if you will. So that gives me some dimensional stability, not as a, a, a complete, uh, sole uh, standalone product, I mix about 50-50 xenograft and, and uh, allograft. 
um, in order to maintain that dimensional stability. So xenograph, just to, to review, you can get porcine, you can get bovine, you can get equine, slowly resorbing, but they're good for maintaining biological space. They have good dimensional stability. I'll mix it with an allograph, typically 50-50 in my sinus elevations. I'll do it in my lateral ridge augmentations as well to give me dimensional stability to help maintain that biological space. Or I'll use it on, as a veneer graft. Um, I'll have, if I have a thread or two exposed on my implants, I'll put some of that bovine xenograft on there. They're you know, available in, in 0.25 cc's or 0.25 grams. So it's a small quantity of bone. You don't have to open an entire vial of uh, one gram of bone. And that I will use as a, a veneer graft to help preserve that biological space to cover those implant threads. Our final category are the osteo, uh, the alloplasts, sorry. And alloplasts are completely synthetic uh, as far as, as uh, material. So they're made in the lab. Um, my preference is a beta TCP, a beta tricalcium phosphate. There's obviously, because they're a synthetic product, there's absolutely no risk of disease transmission. What I what there is is a, a rather long resorption time, usually about six months, sometimes a little bit longer, depending on particle size. Um, that's been my experience, and I will use them in patients that, for whatever reason, whether it's theological or just personal reasons, don't want a human product, don't want an animal product. I'll I'll keep this to accommodate those. And, and they work. I mean, they certainly work. The only issue is the resorption time. So removal of a second molar, filling with a beta TCP product, and then um, you know six months later going in and seeing the regeneration of that alveolar process. So that, those are my, my choices for, for bone graft materials. Um, I hope I've, I've clarified it, but just my go-to is, is a bow, sorry, is a human product, an allograft, uh, whether you use mineralized, demineralized, cortical, cancellous, a combination of, of all of those, or I don't think makes a huge difference. Um, I think it's a very predictable product, and um, I think you'll be successful with either, either of your choices as far as all uh, allographs. So let's talk a little bit about membranes. So we've selected our bone graft material. We're going to put in that socket of that premolar I extracted an allograft. Um, what are we gonna do about a membrane? So a few choices for membranes. Obviously our membrane just to review is going to prevent the faster moving soft tissue cells from the surrounding gingiva from migrating into the defect. I don't want soft tissue in here because that's going to populate the defect and create soft tissue. I want to allow the slower moving osteoprogenitor cells, cells that are gonna form bone from populating my defect and creating a regeneration of that alveolar process. So membranes, what's, what's the function or, or, or goal of membranes? So they're gonna inhibit epithelial in growth. So they're gonna prevent the epithelium from populating in here and, and creating soft tissue in my, in my graft site. They're gonna help with biological space. If this membrane is rigid, if it has some rigidity, it's going to maintain this biological space. It's going to obviously help with graft containment. Um, and let's talk about collagen membranes. So collagen membranes are very popular, very common, um, typically made of type 1 collagen. Their type 1 collagen is the most predominant collagen in, in all the connective tissues in the body. Very easy to manipulate. They are exposed to the, to the oral environment. They'll resorb rather quickly. But uh, the nice thing is if they are exposed, there's really no morbidity associated with, with their exposure. If we look at, at collagen resorption, we know that they're resorbed by enzymatic degradation, by collagenases. Um, typically, a collagen will resorb in seven to 10 days in, in, the, in the oral cavity. If you use something that like a collotape or a coloplug, you know those resorb usually within a week. In order to slow down that resorption, we can cross-link collagen, and that will slow down that resorption. What, how, what do we, how do we cross-link collagen membranes, and what do we mean by that? We mean the linking, the, the connection between the collagen membranes. So there's various ways to, to cross-link these membranes. You can use ultraviolet light. Uh, the reference is glutaraldehyde. Uh, you can irradiate, use glutaraldehyde. 
several chemical methods to cross-link the membranes. And the purpose of this cross-linking is to slow down the resorption time. The collagenases have to work on these, on these cross-linked membranes longer than they would a non-cross-linked membrane. So we look, if we look at a, a uh, bovine collagen membrane, type one collagen that's cross-linked, which is probably the most ubiquitous membrane. Um, again, I'm gonna stay generic, so I'm not gonna give you any, any products per se. Uh, very high tensile strength. Typically they're gonna resorb within, within three months. The other type of membrane we can get is a bow, uh, sorry, a porcine membrane. And these are typically porcine peritoneum collagen. These tend to be very, very pliable. So they tend to be much more pliable. They'll drape over the, con the, the defect much more easily. Um, these are not cross-linked. They're not cross-linked. They're actually bilayer membranes that have multiple layers of, of collagen, which retards the, the resorption as well. And the resorption time, again, is about three to four months, depending on, on, on the membrane thickness and, and uh, processing. So why would you choose one over another? In my mind, it's handling characteristics. If we go back to the collagen uh, membrane that is it bovine type one collagen that is cross-linked, they tend to be a little more rigid, a little more difficult to manipulate. The porcine ones tend to be much more pliable. So they tend to be very, very easily adapted to a defect. That can be a problem in the sense that it makes the, the adaptation a little more problematic as far as handling. They tend to fold over themselves um, and can be a bit, a bit more delicate to use. And then theoretically, the disadvantages of cross-linking, if you look at some of the research, and this is a research article from uh, Medical and Biological Research 2020, it's actually a literature review. Um, they talk about foreign body reactions that occurs with cross-linked membranes that can slow down vascularization. You know, I've used, been using cross-linked membranes for many, many years. I've used porcine membranes as well and really haven't found any, any initial or late reaction as far as the soft tissue, but theoretically that's out there. So I've shared with you two resorbable membranes, um, but that's not what I use for my, my extraction sockets. What I use for my extraction sockets are a dense, polytetrafluoroethylene. And for those of you who remember the Gore-Tex membrane, those were an expanded polytetrafluoroethylene. It's a non-resorbable membrane. It's gonna prevent the bacteria from passing through. It's gonna exclude gingival, <clears throat> excuse me, gingival epithelium. It has some rigidity, so it's going to actually provide some space maintenance. That is the membrane that I use exclusively for my socket grafts, and I'm going to show you why. So if we take a look at a, at a SCM view scanning electron microscope, you're going to see that the surface of the membrane is, is not perforated. It actually has little dimples on it, and those dimples allow the soft tissue to actually grab onto those membranes and help stabilize it uh, underneath the, the, the soft tissue. So the advantage of this membrane, the dense PTFE membrane, um, as many manufacturers out there that make them, is that, so the advantage is does not require primary closure. So you don't have to get primary closure. If you're using a collagen membrane, those, even the cross-linked membranes will resorb quickly if left exposed to the oral environment. So typically when I was using them, I would have to get primary closure. So release of the flaps, changing of the mucogingival junction, you know, the vestibule becomes a little bit shallower. The advantage of these is they're meant to be left exposed. So you don't have to change your mucogingival junction. <clears throat> Excuse me, you don't have to release your flaps. And it promote more keratinized nice tissue because where you have that membrane, the collagen is going to grow underneath it, your connective tissue and create more keratinized nice tissue. And it's very easily removed. The removal, um, this is at six weeks. What, what I have here is my dense PTFE membrane over an extraction socket. So the socket has been grafted with bone. I place this on top of it, it's sutured. Sutures are removed. And then at anywhere from four to six weeks, I'll remove the membrane. When the membrane's removed, um, you can see this is the part that was exposed to the oral environment. This was tucked down under the flap. So we'll talk a little bit about manipulation, but this is my go-to uh, technique or my go-to membrane for socket grafts. When you remove that membrane, what you'll see is that your graft will actually have been covered 
by a very red connective tissue that will epithelialize over time. So you'll have complete closure of that extraction socket. It'll be completely granulated with connective tissue that over time, um, you'll see, you can actually see the outline of that soft tissue uh, is uh, where that, that red tissue was, is completely epithelialized. So you will get more epithelium. And typically when I go in three, depending on the defect, usually about three months, sometimes four months, this is what I'm going to find. I'm going to find host bone. I'm going to find not a concavity, uh, occasionally a convexity, but almost complete regeneration of that alveolar process using this technique. The removal of the membrane is simple. Um, this is in real time. I don't numb the patient. This is the membrane in place after um, typically, uh, as I mentioned, anywhere from four to six weeks. And I'll take an explorer. As you see here, I will put it in one of the dimples and I'll pull. And this is exactly how long it takes. And let me pause it right, oh, sorry. Let me just go through that again, because what I wanna show you so you can see that that socket over the bone graft, over the particulates, is completely granulated. We have uh, connective tissue that's covering that that will then become epithelialized and will give us more, more keratinized tissue. So this is my go-to technique. It's the technique I use exclusively. Um, it's, in my hands, the most predictable and also the most cost-effective. The membranes themselves, we'll talk about that a little later, but are, are extremely cost effective. So membranes removed uh, in a matter of seconds. Okay, so let's go back to our case. Our, our second premolar that is fractured, we, we're going to remove that tooth. We're going to replace it with a dental implant. Um, so we're at the phase where we have extracted the tooth or we will shortly. So I'm gonna create a full thickness flap. I'm gonna go intracellularly around that tooth, I'm going to, to reflect full thickness beyond the mucogingival junction, I'll explain to you why. Now I know if we look at the x-ray, it's a single rooted tooth, uh, it's a conical root, that tooth would come out without a flap, especially because I do have some above the, the crest, but I wanna reflect those flaps so I can uh, tuck that membrane underneath it. So there's my extraction, there's my flap reflection, uh, we're going to obviously correct that socket, remove any granulation tissue that may be at the apex, make sure we've removed all the, the periodontal ligament. We want a clean socket. Um, I typically will rinse these out with either sterile water, occasionally Paradex, sometimes both. I want to make sure I have a clean vascular socket to work with. Once I've done that, I will fill it with my allograft. So we talked about what I'm going to use, I'm going to use an allograft almost 100% of the time, um, unless there's objections to using an allograft, that's what I'm going to use. Um, I do mix it with PRF, but that's not essential to the success of the procedure. But we mix the allograft, I fill it all the way to the alveolar process, so all the way up to the crest, I compact it with some firm comp compaction. And I'm going to cover it with my dense PTFE membrane. Now, what I want to do, you'll see it's, it's a, it's a uh, hourglass shape. So the membrane comes, the particular manufacturer I use, the membrane is 12 millimeters across, 24 millimeters long. I don't usually cut the length. I want, but what I do want is I want this hourglass shape because I don't want it touching the roots of the adjacent teeth. I want it about a millimeter away from the roots of the adjacent teeth. I also want to make sure that it's tucked three to four millimeters under the, the lingual and, and uh, buccal flaps. So I want that membrane tucked. I want to make sure it doesn't touch us the it doesn't touch the adjacent teeth. And I also want to make sure that it sits passively. I don't want it bunching up. So you want to make sure you reflect your flaps enough that the membrane sits very passively. The membrane has a dimpled side, as I showed you, the dimpled size goes towards the soft tissue and that'll help that soft tissue adhere to it. I then put in some interrupted sutures. Um, my preference is a 5-0 Vicryl. Uh, you know, what I'll do is a crisscross mattress type suture just to reapproximate the papilla, make sure that I have good, not primary closure, but good closure. 
So this area is going to stay open. It's, it's not meant to be closed. So I haven't moved my, my mucogingival junction. I haven't touched that at all. Um, you can see the transparency of that soft tissue. You can see a little bit of that membrane uh, poking through. And typically what I'll do is I'll see the patients a week later. I just like to see them a week postoperatively, make sure they're doing okay, make sure there's no signs of infection. I will then see them two weeks after that. So at the three week mark, I'll remove the sutures. And that's why I want that membrane tucked in um, three, three to four millimeters underneath the flap. So when I remove the sutures, it's still stable, it's still passive. And then I'll see them, you know, depending on their schedule on my schedule two weeks after that, you know, sometimes a little bit shorter, sometimes a little bit more, but certainly no longer than six weeks. I don't want that membrane in there longer than six weeks. Um, in this case, we removed the membrane about a month out. You can see that that membrane has been removed and it's completely granulated in. We have complete granulation of that alveolar process um, or, or on top of that alveolar process and bone graft. Um, it's going to be a little bit red. This is actually fibrin. It's not, it's not infection. You may have a few particulate particles at the surface, but extremely predictable. At three months, um, we actually took a CBCT. This is a panoramic reconstruction. And you can see we have complete regeneration of that alveolar process. Um, I plan my implants with the software. You can see here how we have really more than enough bone to, to place our, our implant. So good regeneration of that alveolar process. Um, implant is placed. And, and we're happy about that. So let's look at uh, another case. Uh, actually, we've got about 10 minutes left, so let me speed it up. So this is our preoperative panoramic. You can clearly see our, a vertical root fracture. You can see the large periapical radiolucency. You can see that the radiolucency obviously has blown out the buccal wall completely, but it's also affected the distal aspect of the premolar. So if we, if we go, if we take a look at that. So this is actually the, let me back up just a little bit, um, just so we can look at the panoramic. So although the lesion originated with this molar, you can see that we've blown out the distal wall of, of that tooth. Now, is it possible to regenerate the distal wall of that premolar? Maybe. Is it gonna be predictable? In my hands, it's not. So the plan was to remove both these teeth, graft both these areas, and then, uh, come back and place two implants. So let me move over and uh, show you what it looked like. So this is with the teeth, both teeth extracted. So you can see this is the distal root of the molar. This is the mesial root of the molar. And you can see how that destruction has completely not only removed the buccal wall, but also the distal portion of, of this premolar. So we remove the premolar as well. When I have such a large defect, obviously I've got a four wall defect here. I've got a, actually it's a three wall defect now, but if I had not removed that tooth, it would be a two wall defect, but I've got a huge buckle wall missing. What I'll do is I will mix some allograft with, with my xenograft. So about 70% allograft, 30% xenograft. And the reason for that, it's gonna give me a little bit more dimensional stability. What I will also do is I will, in this case, use a collagen membrane. Because I don't have that buccal wall, because I remove the, the dense PTFE membrane at about you know, four to six weeks, I want that to be more dimensionally stable. I want more protection for that graft, if you will. So I'll use a collagen membrane and I will get primary closure. Um, and this is the post-operative panoramic. You can see that's been grafted. Um, you can see it on the CBCT as well. So because I have no buccal wall here, that collagen membrane will help create that biological space. It'll give me three months of, of healing time, if you will, in a protected space. So when I have a complete blowout like you saw there, I will use that collagen membrane. But let's, um, and there's a one week post-op. But let's go back to my traditional technique that I talked to you initially about using the dense, uh, PTFE membrane. So here we have a fractured molar. Um, root canal was attempted, a, a, a fracture was discovered, so the tooth will be removed. 
Um, there's the removal of the tooth. You can see we've cleaned out the extraction socket. You wanna make sure that you, again, remove any granulation tissue. You wanna make sure you remove um, any periapical radiolucency, all the periodontal ligament. You wanna clean that socket adequately and thoroughly so you don't have, um, we don't have the, uh, any soft tissue there. Okay, there's my allograft. So I have an intact four wall defect. I'm gonna use an allograft. I have, you can see the buckle wall is here. Um, and if you look closely, you can see that I tore the palate, the lingual wall, but that won't affect the, the outcome. There's the allograft. We're gonna pack the allograft completely um, to the crest. And then we're going to use our dense PTFE membrane. Again, the dimpled side out. The nice thing with the membrane, I talked about cost effectiveness. The, the nice thing with this membrane, um, depending on the manufacturer, roughly 35 to $40 a membrane. So really nice, nice to, to, uh, to use because of that cost effectiveness. A membrane does not require primary closure, which is why it's my go-to for my socket grafting procedures. So just, this is a vicral suture, which is my preferred suture. A few interrupted sutures just to help reapproximate those, those papilla. The membrane was cut a, a millimeter away from the teeth. And uh, again, no primary closure, no, no movement of that mucogingival junction. There's my immediate post-operative radiograph, and I take it just to make sure that I filled the socket completely, that I'm all the way up to the alveolar crest, in which case I am. Um, this is a one-week post-op, and that one-week post-op, um, just to take a look at things, make sure that my sutures are, are looking good and that there's no signs of infection. So what I'll do with this one-week post-op, oh, sorry, is I will take a cotton tip applicator, I'll push on the tissues, I'll make sure that there's no no purulins, no exudation, um, make sure I'm happy with, with the way things look. And there's a three month post-op. So the membrane was removed a few weeks after suture removal. So typically between four and six weeks, you can still see the outline of that socket, but you can also see that that's completely keratinized. If we uh, take a closer look, you can see that's nice keratinized tissue that's gonna help with the ultimate implant restoration. When we go back, this was actually four months, but you can see the complete, not only regeneration of that socket, but you can see that there's no con concavity there. I've used other techniques in the past. I've used just using a non crosslink collagen membrane on top, just a, you know, collar coat or a collar plug. And what I'd find, it, it certainly works, but I would get a concavity. When I'd open it up, I'd have a small concavity. I've used just PRF membranes. And again, I'd get a small concavity. But if you look at this technique, if you look at the preoperative and the postoperative, I found that this PTFE membrane, because it's slightly rigid, um, just gives me superior results. It just, it's a little bit more labor intensive than using something resorbable that you don't have to go back in, but it does give me superior results so that when it comes time to, to place the dental implant, I have good thick alveolar bone, I have a good height, and a place my implant, and a place uh, my healing abutment. You can see the amount of keratinized tissue I have around that healing abutment, um, and you can see the, the definitive crown that's been placed on that implant. So, in this very, very brief overview, I wanted to just review with you the, the technique that I use. Uh, I find that the dense PTFE is extremely predictable, is extremely, uh, at least in my hands, works not only very well, but is, is low cost. As far as bone selection, my go-to is an allograft. If I have either a, a wall missing or I need some dimensional stability, I will throw in a few particles of the xenograft just to give me that stability. Um, but typically, allograft, dense PTFE membrane, extremely predictable. I want to thank you for my, your attention. I'm going to give you my, my, uh, my email address here. Always like to hear from colleagues. It's always a pleasure. Uh, if you're down in Miami, certainly give me, give me a, let me know. I'd love to share a drink with you and uh, discuss uh, hopefully not dentally related topics, but uh, just about anything else. 
So actually, I can see there's a couple of questions here. Let me just address those. Okay. Um, why do I remove the, the sutures earlier and why not remove both after four weeks? The sutures tend to get accumulated with eight, they get, tend to get accumulated with plaque. And by week three, they tend to be quite loose. So the patients find them annoying. So I'll remove them at, at, at typically at three weeks. And as far, another question, uh, what's the ratio of xenoallograph for the buccal wall defect? Um, typically, 70% allograft, 30% xenograft. So I'll typically use a half cc of, of uh, allograft and I'll throw in a quarter of xenograft, um, a quarter cc xenograft and just those are the ratios roughly. So, you know, 75, 25, 70, 30. And do I tack down the collagen membrane? I don't tack it down. What I do with that collagen membrane is I actually suture it to the lingual flap. I'll do a horizontal mattress into the flap, into the membrane, then out the membrane, out the flap, and tie that. So it gives me a, a some stability. But if you don't do that, you may want to tack it down to give you more stability. Okay. Do you ever do you graft even first and second molar sites? Is it necessary sometimes? Even if I lost 40% of the bone volume, there's still enough bone for implants. So I'm going to answer this live. Um, so yes, I graft all my extraction sites. And you are correct that even, even if you don't graft the sites, typically in, in the mandibular posterior mandible, because that external oblique ridge is so thick, you have good thick buccal bone. But what I find is that if I don't graft them, I will get a concavity um, in that bone. So I, I will graft everything. Now, in the second molar sites, if the opposing, if the opposing arch has only first molar, and the patient doesn't need a second molar, obviously I won't graft that, but um, I will always graft my, I mean, 99% of the time I'm taking out a tooth, I'm grafting that socket. So hopefully that's that's a good a good answer for you. Um, another question, what's, what's the protocol for an infected socket? So when you say infected, I'm gonna assume, you mean there's purulent, ex they're purulent exudate. Um, I don't like, when there's purulence. Now, certainly these endodontically treated teeth, um, they will uh, sometimes cause purulence. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll follow the same protocol. I will clean out that, that periapical granuloma or, or abscess, if you will. And then I will make sure I'll take a round burr, whether a number eight diamond or a number eight uh, um, carbide burr, I'll go around that. I want to make sure that I get no, no connective tissue, none of that granuloma tissue that's in that wall. I want good, good thick vascular bone around my, uh, my socket, my bone graft rather. What I'll also do is I'll change my protocol for antibiotics. Typically, I'll put the patient on either amoxicillin, 500 milligrams, three times a day, or clindamycin, 300 milligrams, three times a day if they have a... Um, an allergy to penicillin. If I have something that's infected, I will add to that metronidazole. Metronidazole is a fantastic um, antibiotic for the anaerobes, which is usually what you find in these endodontic infections. So I'll combine amoxicillin and metronidazole or clindamycin and metronidazole. And depending if they're taking metronidazole, uh, amoxicillin three times a day, I'll do amoxicillin three times a day and metronidazole 500 milligrams three times a day. Same thing with the clindamycin. So um, that's, the, that's how I address those. Okay, would you recommend grafting in the case of, okay. So this is an issue. So I know that in some countries, the, the allografts are just not available. So what I would, uh, what I would recommend in those, in those areas that you cannot put an allograft or cannot purchase an allograft um, I would either use a synthetic material, something like a beta TCP, which is going to give you great results, just a little bit longer resorption time, um, or they do sell allografts now, sorry, xenografts um, that combine collagen. Um, so not to mention any manufacturers, but it's, it's, a, it's a bovine xenograft with some collagen in it that is going to give you better turnover. So you can use that um, as well. So I would use a synthetic material or a xenograft that has some collagen uh, material in it. 
So um, the dimples you're talking about, the PTFE membrane. Yes, it's a textured membrane. It's the opposite side is non-textured. Um, and you're saying the company, so this, the company has both textures and non-textured. Typically the, the membrane I'm looking at is textured only on one side and that's the connect the soft tissue side because um, the soft tissue side, because it's textured or it will allow the soft tissue to grab onto it. Um, if you're using a non-textured membrane, it will tend to slip out of those tissues a little more easily. Um, not a huge deal. I've actually turned the membrane around more than once and had the smooth side facing the soft tissue and it still, it still worked fine. It's just, it's, uh, as long as your membrane is tucked in well underneath the flaps, you should have no, no issue at all with that. Um, so hopefully that helps. Okay, what is your experience with titanium membrane comparison to the PTFE? <laughs> well, for socket graft applications, I've never used the titanium membrane. Um, and I have used them for ridge augmentation, lateral ridge augmentations. The results are fantastic, but the, the handling of those membranes is, is quite difficult. You really need to um, fixate them well. Um, you wanna make sure that you've got reasonable soft tissue to help, to help uh, cover those membranes because if that tissue is thin and there's any movement, you're gonna get perforation of that membrane. So for a, an extraction socket application, I have not used just a titanium membrane. Okay. Next question. Okay, so this is a very, a very, uh, I think it's a, a very worthwhile question. So the participant is saying that he's attended many soft tissue, oh, sorry, uh, CE courses, and not one is recommended full reflection of full thickness flap and membrane uh, placement unless significant portion of the buck wall is missing. Okay, um, because they don't want to disturb the periosteum. So let's let's address that. The, when I reflect that membrane, and I do reflect it beyond the mucogen, not the membrane, sorry, the soft tissue, I reflect it beyond mucogenital junction, but I'm reflecting a full thickness flap. So I'm actually not disturbing the periosteum. It's still part of my flap. So my periosteum is being reflected from the bone. It's crucial. And I have tried this technique without reflecting the tissue, just putting that membrane underneath the flaps. The membrane doesn't, doesn't last. It, it, it pops out. I need that membrane in there for at least four weeks to get the results I'm getting. So I can tell you from my experience, reflecting the flaps are important because you want to tuck that membrane in passively under those flaps, at least three to four millimeters. The membranes are, I buy are 24 millimeters long. So for a premolar site, I may trim it a little bit. For a molar site, I won't. With that molar diameter, um, you know, that membrane is going to be three, four millimeters on another flap. I need it reflected that much so it's pass it fits passively. So I just find that if I don't do that, I don't get the results. Um, so I would, I would say to you that if you're going to use this membrane, make sure it's tucked completely under, under, the, under the flaps. Hopefully that answers your question. Next question is what volume growth graft is needed for molar premolar site? So, you know, I'm, I'm mixing PRF with all my, my bone graft particles. Um, so it cuts down on the volume, but for a premolar, um, I would say about, if you're not about half a CC and for a molar about a CC um, is what, what you would need. Okay, so question from one of our participants, what do you do if you have purulence at one week? So if I have, so at one week I see them and I push on the, on the membrane, I push on the tissue and make sure there is no purulence. Um, if there is purulence, well, if they're not on metronidazole, I will put them on metronidazole at that point. If um, they are on metronidazole, I'll actually, take a culture and I'll send that off because if I've got them on amoxicillin and metronidazole in combination and I've got, uh, you know, just an extraction socket, I mean, I'm covering the full spectrum of anaerobes and, and, uh, and aerobic bacteria. 
So at that point, I've got something in there that's that's pretty 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 un, un, unpleasant. So I will culture it. I'll take a culture medium. I'll put uh, I'll put send that off to the hospital, the microbiology department, ask for a culture and sensitivity. What I'll do is I'll take chlorhexidine. I'll put it under the flaps, flush that out, um, and you know if they're on moxicillin, 500 milligrams, I'd probably double that. I'll, I'd get tell them to take two three times a day. The, the metronidazole, I really don't want to give more than 500 milligrams um, three times a day. That's going to upset their stomach and they really can't drink any more than that. I will get the, the uh, culture report within four days typically, and I'll see what bacteria I have in there, if they're resistant to anything. I'll see them, obviously, I'll follow them closely. I'll see them a week later. If they're still purulence, if they're still not looking great, um, I'll take it out. I'll take, I'll, you know, Give them some anesthesia, numb it, take everything out, flush it out, and let it heal naturally. And we'll come back and put uh, and, and address the grafting at that point. But I can tell you that's rare that that's happened. I mean, it has happened to me, um, and that's what I've done. And it was a patient who was allergic to penicillin, so she was on clindamycin, um, and then I put her on the the uh, excuse me the uh, metronidazole subsequently. And this never healed right. So I, I took out the bone graft. I let it heal naturally with, with nothing. There was still enough, enough bone volume for us to put a smaller diameter implant. And that's what we did. Thank you. Okay. Uh, with PTFE, do you find that you were making a thick gingiva or do you need to augment prior to implant placement? So, you know what? It, it really depends on the thickness of tissue. If I have thin gingiva to begin with, that's an excellent question. It's going to be thin. So what I'll do at the time of implant placement um, is augment at that time. I'll take some, either some connective tissue from the palate, from the tuberosity, or I can use a, a dermis allograft to put under the flaps at the time of implant placement. But yes, it's not going to give me very thick tissue if I don't have thick tissue to begin with. So it's not gonna augment the tissue. The tissue is usually uh, as thin or as thick as the surrounding tissues. Okay, are there any specific post-op instructions after the PTFE? Um, really not. I don't, I don't, uh, my normal instructions post-operatively are a soft cold food for two days. I give them an ice pack. I limit physical activity. I give them an NSAID, uh, ibuprofen, 800 milligrams. Um, once I remove that membrane, that tissue is a little bit raw. And I tell them just to you know, be gentle for a few days. But there's no, no specific instructions with the PTFE than I would with any, any type of extraction. So a question, do you place implants any different in the graft material versus natural bone? Really depends on the, on the density of the natural bone, um, whether or not I, I uh, or sorry, the density of, of the site, whether it's natural bone or grafted bone. Now, normally, um, you know, when you go into these sites, they're usually not as dense as host bone. Uh, that's, that's fresh. You know, when, when we, we graft sites, it takes a while for that bone to feel fully mature. So if I do find that my, my bone is a little bit soft, I'll undersize the osteotomy. What I mean by that is if you have an implant that takes three drills, I'll drill the first two to full depth. The last one, I won't drill to full depth. I'll drill maybe halfway down. So it engages more forcibly at the apical half of that uh, at osteotomy. Um, that's really the only the only difference that I make. I'll do that for natural bone as well. I mean, sometimes in the maxilla, posterior maxilla, your cortical is so thin that you don't have you don't have uh, good good density. So I'll undersize that osteotomy a little bit. A question: Why not place the implant at the same time? Um, I have in some circumstances, but I'll do that only if I have good, the ability to get good primary stability apical to that implant. But I'll ne I won't do it if I'm missing a buccal wall. I won't do it if it's a periapical radiolucency. If it's an endodontically treated tooth, I do not like to do uh, implant placement at the same time as, as uh, socket grafting. 
Um, so another question, do you ever place implants immediately into socket? I will, provided I can get that primary stability, provided there's no periapical radiolucency. And the only, well, that's not the only reason. It depends on the age and the, and the health of the patient. You know, we have to talk about wound healing. I think that it's important to make sure that the patient's wound healing abilities are adequate. And, um, you know, I'm in Southeast Florida, which is a retirement uh, mecca for many, many people. So my patient population tends to be a little bit older. Um, some of these people do have some health issues. So staging things allows me to just evaluate their wound healing abilities. Um, and it's just more predictable for me. But if I have a tooth that's got a vertical fracture, it happened a few days ago, I can, you know, I've got bone apical to that. I can stabilize an implant. Certainly that makes sense too, provided there's no uh, contraindications uh, health-wise. Okay. Um, can sticky bone allographic period be a good option to reserve socket dimension without using membrane? In my opinion, no. So the question is, can we just use PRF with, with bone and not put a membrane on top? And the reason for that is that there's, there's not going to be anything to provide to prevent those gingival soft tissue cells from migrating into, the mem into that defect. It will work. You will get good dimensional regeneration. But what I have found is at the crest, that's where you're going to get your concavity. And where that makes a difference in my mind um, if you're in the posterior maxilla or even in the in the mandible, if you're close to the inferior alveolar nerve, you know, preserving another millimeter or two of bone can make the difference between a normal 10 millimeter implant and a shorter eight millimeter implant. So um, I always use a membrane. It's a little more, it's a little more um, labor intensive in the sense that you will uh, have to see the patient more often if you just use an allograph of PRF, you see them a week or so later, take out your sutures and you're done. I, I need to see them about three times after the extraction. So it creates more patient volume for me and I'm not charging for these, these uh, post-op visits. So it does become more labor intensive and less cost effective, but the result I get is just far superior. So I uh, always use a membrane. Okay, first case, second premolar. I'll tell you why, in case you didn't notice, at the apex of that premolar was a periapical radiolucency. Uh, so the question is, in the first case, it was a premolar, the one that was fractured, endodontically treated. There was a lesion at the apex of it. I don't want to take a, a chance when there's a lesion. I'm always going to graft and come back later. Um, so another question, can we use an antibiotic mixed with an allograft or xenograft? I don't. I know some of my colleagues do. Some of them will actually hydrate their bone graft materials with a 5% metronidazole solution. You can actually get metronidazole 5% solution um, in bags. Um, and one of my colleagues uh, does hydrate the graft with that. He swears by it. And, uh, you know, certainly you can do that. I don't. I find that just thorough debridement and uh, making sure that the, the antibiotics are, are appropriate um, is usually the way I go. Okay, what about calcium sulfate? So calcium sulfate, I know, can be used as a membrane. You can use it as an, you know, back in the day, we used to add calcium sulfate to demineralize grafts in order to provide a calcium source. Um, I don't use it. So I don't, uh, you know, I don't have a, an answer for you in the sense that I don't use it. Uh, certainly you can use it on, on the top of a graft as a membrane, but I don't have any experience, so I can't, I can't, uh, can't address it. Sorry. So another go, oh, no question, just clinical pearls. Well, thank you, Daniel, for that lovely comment. Um, do you prescribe chlorhexidine? Yes. Okay. So the question is, do I prescribe chlorhexidine as a mouth rinse? I do prescribe every patient leaves with a prescription for chlorhexidine. I know there is some research out there that proves that chlorhexidine, or I'm not going to say proves that demonstrates that chlorhexidine inhibits fibroblast migration. Uh, so what? I mean, chlorhexidine is a broad spectrum antimicrobial. It's antifungal. It's a fantastic fantastic antiseptic. 
Um, I'm not worried about the, the inhi inhibition of fibroblasts from chlorhexidine. I just want the, my patients to have a clean mouth. So yes, chlorhexidine for everyone. Okay. So another thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the thank yous. So use of osteogen plugs by Implantan boasts no need for remembering your thoughts on this. Okay. So I, so the, for those of you not familiar, the osteogen plugs are a collagen plug with a xenograft in there. Um, they will work in a site that has four good walls. Um, and I have used them. And what I have found is they're not as dimensionally stable as an allograft with the, with the uh, PTFE membrane. So I just find them not as predictable. So I have used them, but I still stick to my allograft with PTFE. To remove soft tissue in the socket with a high speed or a low speed. I'll use a high speed. I'll take a number eight diamond and you know, I'm not, I'm not looking to create a, a wider socket. I'm just going to touch very gently the, the edges of the wall. Um, if I have that granulomatous tissue, typically I'll just take a curette. You can get serrated curettes that help quite a bit that will really uh, clean out the, uh, the defect. Um, and then if, if I can't, or I've got some, some nasty tissue in there, I'll use the, the high speed. Obviously you want a surgical handpiece. You want one that exhausts if it's, if it's a turbine, you want one that exhausts back, not into the socket, or if you're using an electric handpiece, obviously that's not an issue. Make sure you're irrigating as well so you don't overheat the bone. You get frequent side effects when you use metronidazole. Metronidazole is an excellent antibiotic. Unfortunately, metronidazole causes horrible gastric upset um, and patients cannot drink alcohol with it. If they drink alcohol, they will throw up 100% of the time. So yes, I do get some side effects. Um, you know, if it's an elderly patient, instead of doing the 500 milligrams three times a day, I'll do 250 four times a day. I tell them to take a probiotic. I tell them to drink lots of water. Um, I tell them to take it with food. Probiotics help quite a bit. Um, so that's, that's what I advise them. Okay, next question. Do you recommend to graft the sock in a way for four months prior to put the implant? You know what? It really depends. Um, the time is going to depend on the material I'm using. So my combination is to use an allograft with a um, some autologous growth factor, PRF, PRP, PRGF, whatever whatever you're using. I find that with my cytoplasm membrane, I can typically go in at at uh, three months. What premolar? Um, incisor. If it's a molar, if there's a large defect, I'll wait for. So three to four months is my rule. Now, what I'll sometimes do is, so when they come in at, at that three month period, I'll take a, a limited view CBCT just for that area. I'll look at the density. You know, most units you can compare to Hounsfield units. If I'm not thrilled about it, I'll just give it another month and uh, we'll place the implant then. Good. So I want to thank you for an excellent presentation. Great questions, great answers. And I look forward to see most of the people in person in Atlanta or at other meetings. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening, all of you. Avi, you have the last word. Well, again, I want to I want to thank you all for attending. Um, you know, I certainly hope this gave you a little bit of insight about what I do and hopefully a pearl or two. Um, you know, there's more than one way to do any procedure, but I found this to be very, very uh, predictable. So hopefully um, you will as well. Have a wonderful evening. You have my email. I'm happy to answer questions and I wish you all a, a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>